I'm Wes Carey. During the Persian Gulf War, I was the first lieutenant band deck department head here aboard the USS Missouri. The USS Missouri, known as the last battleship, was commissioned in 1944 during the Second World War. The people you're about to meet participated in the defining moments of the life of the USS Missouri. Their words form an intimate portrait of this great ship. I'd like to invite you to join me for a personal history of the mighty Mo, as told by some of the people who know her best, the officers and men of the USS Missouri. I left Shoemaker, California to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where the Missouri was being built. And I was a part of a skeleton crew. There were about 47 of us. And it was called the pre-commissioning detail. We lived across Flushing Avenue from the Navy Yard. And our job was to come over and learn the ship, learn how to get around on the ship, find out where all the water lines were and the ventilation lines. And some of us went to school also, like welding school, right in the Navy Yard. On January 29th, 1944, three years after her keel was laid, the USS Missouri was christened and launched. The dedication speech was made by the man from Missouri, then Senator Harry S. Truman. The ship's sponsor was his daughter, Margaret. The Missouri and her three sister ships, the Iowa, the New Jersey, and the Wisconsin, would be the largest of the finest warships in the world and the armament to be installed in the Missouri will make her the most formidable craft to float. The christening and launching of this greatest warship of all time illustrates the decisive answer which the democracies of the world are making to the challenge of the aggressor nations. Missouri is a show-me state. The battleship Missouri will show all Americans, indeed all the world, her innate seaworthiness, her val valiant fighting spirit, and the invincible power of the United States Navy. The motto of the state of Missouri is Salus Populi Supreme Alexesto. The welfare of the people is a supreme law. I know that will be the motto of the officers and men of Missouri. May this great show me ship, named for the show me state, be an avenger to the barbarians who wantonly slaughtered the heroes of Batan. And may that ship Missouri and the other ships of our Navy do their full share on behalf of the people of the United States to maintain the peace which will follow our total victory. I thank you. As a ship designated, USS Missouri BB-63 slid into the East River bound for her final fitting out. She began the voyage that would fulfill President Roosevelt's commitment that American forces would act to bring an end to the most terrible war in world history. The Mighty Mo was commissioned in New York on June 11th. Her first captain was William Callahan. I was present for the commissioning of the ship. It was a solemn occasion, but it was a big ceremony. All, all hands were at quarters. The captain came aboard and uh, the uh, a ceremonial key was handed to him as the skipper of the ship. It was a thrill to have our own captain uh, and underway. The Missouri then embarked on a shakedown cruise, aimed to hone the readiness of the ship and her complement of 2,500 sailors and marines. Because of the threat of enemy submarine attacks in the Atlantic Ocean, the Mo is given a coat of dazzle camouflage paint. When we came out of the Navy Yard, the ship had uh, concentric circles 
painted on the bows and all the way back uh, to cut down on his silhouette. On a shakedown cruise, they, they uh, fired the guns, they uh, put the ship through different maneuvers to see how it handles, they uh, do everything they can like you would if you were breaking in a new car. And those, those things that did not meet the standards, they were noted and back to the Navy Yard we went to fix those discrepancies. With her systems tested and her men ready for combat, the Missouri arrived in San Francisco, where she was fitted out as a fleet flagship. I uh, went aboard the Missouri in San Francisco on December 10th, 1944. When we left San Francisco, we arrived at Pearl Harbor on uh, Christmas Eve, 1944. When we celebrated Christmas, even though there were 2,700 people aboard the ship, it was lonesome because, you know, it hadn't been too long uh, since I had left my family and my brand new wife and so on. Being in Pearl Harbor that December, I was reminded of the Christmas season just three years previous when the Japanese surprise attack resulted in the destruction of battleship roll and the deaths of so many men. I have two friends that were aboard, that are still aboard uh, Arizona, uh, entombed there. They, they, were, they were caught in that. They're still there. We left Pearl Harbor uh, for the South Pacific on January 1st of 1945. After the destruction of the battle force at Pearl Harbor, the rebuilt Navy diversified the Pacific Fleet. Missouri headed for the war zone as part of the fast carrier force. Her role was to provide anti-aircraft cover for the new carrier-based strategy. Presently, I'm sitting in what we call Radio 2, and this was the main transmitter room. However, we had 10 different transmitter rooms. I came aboard uh, with a rating radio technician third class. That uh, uh, put me in the CR division, which is communication radio, and uh, the RT had the responsibility of maintaining all of the communication equipments aboard the ship. Now this is Radio 2. This is the area that I worked out of. Uh, all the maintenance crews worked out of this, uh, this particular area. And uh, I see there's a lot of changes in here uh, since I was aboard. In this area, we had probably five large transmitters that, uh, that were located in this area. Over on this side, over in here, we have uh, uh, missing uh, today are the motor generators that were used to power up these heavy equipments. And of course, the air conditioning units over here are uh, much the same, I'm sure, as they were way back in 45. The, uh, but we're, we're missing, again, lots of equipment here. Now down over in this corner, we have a freak meter, frequency meter that used to uh, mount on that bulkhead, and we would patch the frequencies, set up frequencies in this piece of equipment, and patch them over to the transmitters over here, and tune the transmitters, get them up online, and, and we were ready to go. This was my station during anchoring and during the recovery of the anchors. This is the brake for the starboard anchor. That is, you're stopping the chain. This is the one for the port anchor. It was the job of the chief carpenter's mate to man these wheels during the time that anchor was dropped or the anchor was recovered and he took his orders from the chief boatswain, who was a warrant officer, a chief warrant officer usually, at least he was on the Missouri here. One of the little stories that we have to tell about this, the chief boatswain, we had a loose anchor and so he called me and we came up to tighten up the anchor and he went up into, right at the bow there, and about that time we were in some great, pretty heavy seas and we took water over and it hit him and he slid right down this way 
on the deck and there was a, a sailor standing behind the splashboard in front of the guns who got a hold of him where he'd have gone over the side. I couldn't reach him because I was on these things and I wasn't going to let go. <laughs> the Missouri was threatened by several typhoons. Extensive damage was inflicted by towering walls of solid waves, known as green water. I recall uh, working on the bridge area on some of the equipment up there while we were in a typhoon. And I can remember that we were taking green water over the top of turret two, which is uh, the pilot house that I was working in at that time was not a great deal higher than turret two. And I always used to say that it was green water up to the bridge. And uh, whether it was really green water or foam, I'm not sure, but it, it was quite exciting to see this, uh, to see that bow out there rise and rise and rise and then drop. And then you've got the, the water coming over. In fact is, I believe it was that same uh, typhoon where we lost the uh, 20 millimeter guns up on the bow. They, they were damaged from the, from the wave action. It was that much pressure. The damage was uh, quite extensive up forward at that time. Yeah. The, the sounds of, of the ship uh, going through these, uh, these waves would be a pounding, of course, when you, uh, as the bow rises and, and drops, you know, you've got, uh, you feel probably more than you hear. And, uh, and the, the ship will, will drive down into those waves and you kind of get a shudder and then you're rising again. Uh, and then trying to sleep in a, in a rack uh, when you're going through a typhoon is, is, is kind of <laughs> tough to do because you've got to brace yourself and uh, it, it was the rolling that was the most uh, difficult because our, our bunks were uh, situated fore and aft. And so you got the roll. The pitching was not, it didn't bother you a great deal, but it was the rolling that you had to brace yourself for. And I'd like to take you in here and show you the exact spot that I uh, had my rack when I was aboard back in 45. As you see here today, we have three bunks high and they're bunks and they have nice thick mattresses uh, when their mattresses are aboard. But in those days, we had iron pipe, uh, that, uh, the outline of our rack, and we laced our canvas to that rack and we had five high in, in this space here. There were probably 30 people in here uh, in this particular compartment. Uh, I was lucky. I, I had the middle one in here, so I didn't have to climb on anybody to get in and out. Uh, but they were climbing on mine to get to the upper racks. And it, uh, incidentally, that if the fellow above you didn't uh, didn't lace his uh, canvas uh, tight enough, then he's uh, he's encroaching down on your area. But we got along. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't recognize, I guess, that there was anything that uh, was going to be any different. While at sea, the Missouri is designed to be a self-contained floating city, a place where her crew can work, live, and play. From mail call to medical care, from movies on the fantail to round-the-clock meals, the ship was continually active, meeting her crew's needs. The, the uh, food aboard uh, Missouri, in my estimation, was not bad. Uh, Wednesdays, that was bean day. And as I recall, we had beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it wasn't all that bad. It was only one day a week. During our time out in the Pacific, we began to notice little black specks in our bread. And on closer inspection, it, it showed that they were some kind of weevils in the bread. So we would pick the weevils out of the bread and, and eat the bread. And then as time progressed, we uh, didn't want to take the time to pick the weevils out, so we just ate weevils, bread, and all. And then we just joked that we were getting fresh meat along with our bread, so it was, it was okay. Then it didn't seem to bother any of us. 
When we were operating out in the Pacific and whenever it was possible, uh, I'm sure that each of us, I did, I wrote nearly every day. And of course, we, we couldn't get the letters off the ship every day. We would post them at the post office up on the second deck. Each of our letters was censored, so you really weren't able to say a great deal about what the operations were. Uh, but someone aboard the ship wrote letters that was disseminated to each of the crew, crewmen aboard and uh, we could address these letters to our uh, folks at home and uh, the it was very general the information that was there and when we were given uh, provided supplies the supply ships came along and we, we picked up fuel and and uh, supplies and, and of course uh, mail uh, sacks and sacks of mail came aboard and our sacks and sacks of mail left the ship and, and eventually found its way home. You wouldn't go to the post office and pit, look for your letters up there. We had a person from the division uh, assigned to go pick up our mail. So he had uh, armfuls of mail and it would come down into this space and distribute to the maintenance gang and then he'd, he'd have letters for the, for the radio operators and that would be distributed up in Radio 1. That was very important that, that we did receive these uh, letters from home. The Missouri had numerous regularly scheduled activities for crew members who were off duty. Some were meant to help the men relax and have fun. Other events brought them spiritual support. What I remember are the poker games that were conducted right down here in Radio 2. And, um, I, I can't tell you what we used as a table, but it probably was some piece, large piece of metal that we uh, balanced on the top of the motor generators here. But uh, that, that was the extent of the recreation down here. However, we did have smokers uh, occasionally, and uh, wrestling, boxing, and uh, those activities. Uh, they, they were the organized activities for the ship. Of course, we had services uh, each Sunday uh, conducted by the chaplains aboard, and that was incidentally very well attended in, in my uh, recollection. And uh, when, it, when we were able, we had those services out on the fantail. Where we had lots of room. When we arrived in Ulithi, we were assigned to uh, carrier task groups, and our job was to provide anti-aircraft cover for those carriers. We were some successful in the time we were out there. We downed 11 Japanese aircraft. When, uh, when we get into a situation where we're going to be involved with enemy ships, enemy aircraft, so forth, general quarters is sounded. And that means each of us has a specific station that we've got to get to as quick as we can. General quarters, we just called it GQ. I can recall one time that I was, I was working up at this 10th level, Radio 10, and uh, we, GQ was sounded, and I couldn't leave the space until I had been relieved by the person that would have uh, that as a GQ station. So he never, we uh, got up there, and so I stayed, and uh, we have binocular slots in that compartment up there, and there's a little uh, hatch that is supposed to be flipped down and dog close those windows. But I thought it would be interesting to see what was going on out there, so I left those ports open. And I was amazed at the aircraft coming in, the aircraft being launched from the carriers, the uh, downing of some of the uh, Japanese aircraft coming in, explosions uh, 
all over the horizon. And I'm glad I survived that without <laughs> getting anything through those little ports up there. Along with the rest of the fast carrier force, part of Missouri's mission was to destroy Japanese military strongholds, crippling their ability to respond to the planned Allied landings at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Accuracy in targeting was crucial. Scout planes acted as the indispensable eyes of the ships at sea. The Missouri carried two float-type planes, and they were mounted on catapults, both port and starboard. They were fired off the catapult with a uh, five-inch shell. The uh, shell was put in uh, right alongside the catapult, and the explosion then carried the uh, carriage for forward and catapulted the plane out into space. To recover those planes, the ship would have to make a starboard or a port turn, a very sharp one, to smooth out the sea. Then the planes would come in and land on the smooth water. They were used to spot for the big guns that were hit, maybe bombardment. And they'd get up above the beach that they were bombarding and they could tell by radio, they could tell then where the shells were landing whether it was short or long or whatever. They became a very integral part of bombardment, beach bombardment. Probably the first time that we had a chance to do any shore bombardment was on Okinawa. And that's when we fired a number of rounds from all the 16-inch turret onto Okinawa. And of course then we moved up into the area of the Japanese homeland islands. We bombarded into the uh, Tokyo area, not Tokyo itself, but the, some of the industrial areas. Missouri's mighty 16-inch guns destroyed numerous military and industrial targets. This footage from 1950 illustrates the efficiency of the gunfire team. To fire your guns, this is after main battery plot, so you would have communication from here to the turret officer and the turret captain in the turret. And they would tell you what you were gonna shoot. We would break that powder out, you know, get it out of the cans in the magazine. And we would uh, find where the projectiles we were gonna shoot for that day because they're sitting on their base on the upper or the lower projectile flats. And you would get your orders to load. And if you loaded your projectile would come up your projectile hoist in a couple stages, would come up behind your spanning tray, your gun would go to 2305 minutes elevation, and it would be steady right there. Your spanning tray would go out, the front of it would be inside the back of the chamber of the gun. Your projectile would then be laying in a horizontal position and your rammerman would ram it full force into the barrel. And when it would go into the barrel, it would be seated into the rotate bands. Then your rammerman would retract his rammer. When he retracted his rammer, the gun captain, who was on the right-hand side, he would point towards the window where the powder cart operator could see. They would open the door to the powder cart and it would be a tray and three rounds of powder would roll down into your spanning tray. Two rounds would be pushed, or two bags would be pushed forward. One bag would be pushed aft, and uh, then they'd move your powder cart another level. They'd dump three more rounds, and they would go, lay down in your, in your spanning tray. And always the red end, the quilted end, of the powder bag would be aft because that's the end you ignite to shoot the round. Then your rammerman would then ram the six bags of powder into the chamber. And there's a lip in there and you just have a certain place you put it inside the chamber, then you retract your rammer. It comes all the way back aft in the gun room. Your spanning tray will come back up. Your breech will close. Your gun captain hits the handle on your breach to close it and lock it. He gets back off of the, while all this is going on, underneath is the, the primerman. Your primerman is putting a primer into the Mark 14 fire lock. 
and he gets out of the way. The gun captain will then step back onto his platform off the side of the gun. He hits a ready switch, and when you hit a ready switch, it'll light a light in a turret booth telling you the center gun is ready, it's loaded, and the gun will also go out into wherever the signal from the plot room is coming from, or is, I should say. And you're ready to shoot. When they give you commands fire, then your turret officer can close his key, or if he has a button, and various other people in the turret, when they're ready, they close their keys. Inside the turret, it's not very much noise. You've got all the machinery running. The sound is outside. In April, the Missouri and other ships of the Fast Carrier Force were subjected to a harrowing series of air attacks from Japanese bombers and by the suicide bombers known as Kamikaze, the divine wind of the Japanese Imperial Forces. Missouri's crew endured the strain of extraordinary and constant vigilance. During some of the operations, I had a GQ station at that time down in Combat Information Center. And we had a talker on the phone down there that was receiving information from topside. And uh, he was excitedly relaying to everyone down in CIC that we had this kamikaze coming in from aft. And uh, he was giving us a blow by blow. He's up, he's down, and uh, he's hit. April the 11th. 1945, this was my battle station along with four other damage controlmen. Our job was to put out any spot fires or any other damage that might occur. We got word very shortly that we'd been hit by a kamikaze and gasoline had been spewed all over the decks up above us here. And as a uh, damage controlman, I came up from Tour 2, and we were fighting fire all along here under the five inch ready boxes and the 40 millimeter. It came in from this quarter, and as it was coming in, you could see tracer bullets going through. I believe at the time it was set up where every third or fifth shell out of the 40 millimeters was a tracer. And you could see tracers going right through, but he still came on. Right out here about 50 feet or so, the plane broke in two and uh, it was said that he dropped the bomb out there. However, the engine part and the Japanese pilot hit right about here. The only thing that came aboard was a wing and half of the Japanese pilot. And it came in right here and it spewed gasoline all over this area here all the way to the surrender deck. It was that fire that we had to fight to put out. That pilot was buried a few days afterwards. He was sewed up in a canvas bag and just about where the quarter deck starts, the gangway starts, he was deezed over the side, buried at sea with full colors. I, uh, I remember how I felt about it. I thought it was a very humane thing to do at the time. Harry Truman, who had become vice president in the November 1944 election, became president following the death of Franklin Roosevelt in April 1945. Truman, who was well served by the experience of his Navy leaders, who increasingly outguessed the tactics of Emperor Hirohito's high command. Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, directed the blunt spoken Admiral William Bull Halsey to assume command of the Third Fleet the Missouri became Halsey's flagship. Sometime when we were off Okinawa, Admiral Halsey called down to the, or one of his aides called down to the carpenter shop and uh, he said he wanted to see the chief carpenter's mate. So I went up to the wardroom and he had a crate that he'd been given by the Reno Chamber of Commerce. So I opened it up for him and it was a saddle, a bridle, and a saddle blanket. And he said, Chief, can you make me a horse? And I said, Admiral, if you tell me to make a horse, I'm going to have to try, but I never made one before. So he kind of laughed and he says, no, Chief, what I want is just something to show the crew. I can hang the saddle on the, on the horse and just for the crew. So I said, sure, Admiral, I can do that. So we made him a horse and uh, to, to, to uh, display his saddle 
on. And uh, so I took it up here, and he said, well, let's put it on. So we tried it, and it fit pretty well. We put the saddle blanket on, and, and he said, well, now help me up into the saddle here. And I helped him up in the saddle, and he said, you know, Chief, if I don't keep my big mouth shut, I'm going to have to ride that damn white horse of Hirohito's. The war in Europe ended on May 8th. Slowly, American and Allied forces were gaining control of the course of the war in the Pacific. The Imperial High Command had made a series of fatal tactical errors which decimated their air and naval defenses. An invasion of the Japanese homeland islands was among the considered options. Sometime in around the 1st of August, they had, they had chosen a bunch of hands uh, to, uh, for landing. And it was supposed to be a coordinated landing, Navy, Army, Marine Corps, and everyone. There were several fellows in my division. As a matter of fact, there was a couple of my carpenter's mates who were issued uh, a landing gear, uh, uh, that is, uh, clothing, uh, in case they were called. That did not come to pass because after the, they dropped the atomic bomb, uh, shortly afterwards, the Japanese surrendered, and that invasion force was not needed then. When we were informed uh, by Captain Murray that uh, via PA system over the whole ship that the war was over, they, um, it, it certainly was a sense of relief, even though we still had to be uh, pretty careful on, on our what we were doing or how we operated and so on. But it was with some relief that, that we received that information. And of course it was uh, party time as, as you could imagine. <laughs> like clapping each other on the back and shaking hands and, and that type of thing. And uh, the whistles blowing in, in that part of the uh, fleet that we were in at that time. But it was just the fact that, that it was over, we had survived, and we were gonna be going home back to those that uh, we loved and loved us. The Joint Chiefs of Staff asked President Truman where the formal surrender should take place. Truman replied that it would dramatically underscore Japan's total defeat if the Japanese surrender was staged aboard a U.S. naval ship in Tokyo Bay. Admiral Nimitz was, meanwhile, finalizing plans for the peaceful occupation of Japan. President Roosevelt died in April of 1945. Mr. Truman was vice president, became president, and at the time that, that uh, Admiral Nimitz was requested to pick the site for the signing of the surrender documents, he uh, very astutely decided that it probably should be aboard the USS Missouri, named after the state of Missouri, where our president uh, had originated. The feeling was that, can we trust them to let us get into Tokyo Bay? And uh, preceding us were several destroyers and a cruiser that went in ahead of us before we anchored in Tokyo Bay. And the feeling was that, well, they did it once, they may do it again. That was, that was a pretty pervasive feeling of board ship. By August 29th, the Missouri was anchored a few miles south of Tokyo Bay, where they received navigational charts and minefield plots. For the next two days, while minesweepers cleared the bay, a close eye was kept on Tokyo's airfield and naval base. When we uh, went into Tokyo Bay, of course, we're at, at um, uh, certain conditions aboard ship that where we are dogged down on the hatches, uh, dogged down is locked. And uh, in case we would strike anything or hit a mine that, that was uh, not charted, anything like that so we could protect the, the ship. So you're not up on deck except those folks that are stationed up in those areas. So uh, when we got on anchor and had a chance to go up, I was impressed, certainly with Mount Fujiyama, 
but also impressed with the fact that as I looked around with the, uh, the trees on the shore, that type of thing, it wasn't a great deal different from Puget Sound. September 2nd, 1945, this was the surrender deck. It was on, these, on this deck that the Japanese delegation signed the conditions of the surrender to General MacArthur. On the outside of the deck, we had built a, a long platform for photographers to be on. And over here was a, uh, a gun had been taken off, only the gun tub was still there, and they had, we'd put a platform on top of that. I had come to this deck uh, with my first class petty officer to hang Admiral Perry's flag above the door, by the captain's door here. And after we had hung it, ceremonies were just about to start, just a few minutes before ceremonies were starting. So we went through the door, which leads to the wardroom, and back up, and we went up to the yard arm. I had found myself up here near the yard arm with a Russian photographer, a commander, one of my first class petty officers. The four of us were in the tub. We knew that history was being made and we were all very thrilled about it. We were watching the arrival of all the high brass in the Navy, admirals and captains, and they were standing right down below us here along the barbette of turret two. Admiral Halsey, Nimitz, and uh, the other officers were up against the barbette, and about uh, a half an hour later, MacArthur arrived on the port side in a destroyer, and he was piped aboard by a boatswain mate, and he came up the ladder just at the end of the surrender deck, and there was no doubt in anyone's mind who was in charge. The whole ship was very, very quiet. When he came aboard the Missouri, MacArthur went to Admiral Halsey's cabin to await the arrival of the Japanese delegation. The Japanese delegation arrived and they were standing just about on the outside of where the plaque now stands and they were standing in the very hot sun. I felt kind of sorry for them because the sun was coming down and they were dressed in tails and top hat. The general that had come with him was in his khakis and the sun was very hot. I thought that they should have been given chairs or something even though they were my enemies at the time. Then all of a sudden MacArthur was coming and uh, a buzz went through the ship and he took his place behind a mess table that they had set up for the surrender table. It was just an ordinary mess table, but it was covered with some green velvet covering that made it good to write on, I guess. And then MacArthur began the proceedings. From where I stood up here, I could watch his hands and they were shaking. And uh, uh, he began the ceremonies uh, in a very stern voice. And uh, there was no quavering in his voice, but you could tell that even MacArthur was nervous at the time. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. Even though the, all the activity was uh, up here on the O1 level and on the main decks, there were some of us that weren't fortunate enough to be up here and we had duties below decks. My own was down in the transmitter room. We had to keep our transmitters up uh, so that we could be transmitting uh, the information necessary to, so the world would know what was happening up here. The time had come for the signing of the instrument of surrender. The first signatory was Japanese Foreign Minister Shigemitsu. The Japanese aides came up with uh, Shigemitsu who signed on the paper, and then uh, the other uh, signators 
came up one by one. With a keen sense of the historical significance of his actions, MacArthur used five different pens to sign his name. MacArthur then signed and he took one pen, he gave it to Vinegar Joe Stilwell, General Stilwell. He gave the other pen to General Jonathan Wainwright, who had been a prisoner of the Japanese. The third pen went to the archives in Washington, D.C., and the fourth to the archives at West Point. The general saved the last one as a souvenir for Mrs. MacArthur. When it was all over, MacArthur announced that these proceedings are over. And uh, Halsey and, and all the other admirals then gathered around, and there was quite a uh, bunch of people right down on the deck there. And then one by one, they started to leave. It was a great thrill for me to watch this proceeding because I knew that history was being made. I think everyone aboard knew that this was a piece of history that would last for many, many years. And it was a thrill for me to see all the admirals and generals that uh, I had read about uh, during the war. The piece of decking that I'm holding has an inscription on it and it says, made of teak wood from the deck of the USS Missouri where the surrender terms were signed in Tokyo Bay September 2nd, 1945. And it came right out from under this, pla this uh, plaque that was struck later and put, in the put by the Navy Yard in the deck here to commemorate this particular spot on the ship. I was the chief carpenter's mate on here and I, had, I got five pieces of the deck I gave one to Captain Murray, I gave one to my first lieutenant, I gave one to my division officer, and one to the engineering officer because he had had these uh, brass plaque things made for us, and I took the fifth one. That was my privilege as, <laughs> as the chief carpenter's mate. After the uh, signing ceremony, the Missouri left Tokyo Bay and we picked up about four or five hundred sea bees in Guam. And we were going to take them back to San Francisco. But uh, when we got to Pearl Harbor, orders were changed and they wanted us straight through the Panama Canal to New York City. Going through Panama Canal on the way home was quite an uh, experience for me. Uh, never having been through, I, as I indicated, I'd picked up the ship at San Francisco, so she had already come through on her uh, uh, westward trip. Uh, going back, uh, we uh, went through the canal and uh, I was amazed that with a 108-foot beam on this vessel and 110-foot wide locks through the Panama Canal, you can imagine that there wasn't a great deal of uh, clearance. So we'd, I, I would be up on deck whenever I had a chance and, and uh, going through the, some of the locks that first we'd, we'd move off to one side and we'd scrape on the concrete there and then we'd move over to the other side and scrape on that side. So it, uh, we didn't have a lot of space going through. But it was, it was a thrill to, uh, to get through the, the lakes and, and, and the locks that, uh, that combined uh, make up the Panama Canal. When we got to New York City, the city gave us the keys. There were great big signs, welcome home. Uh, it was just a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful thing to be aboard ship uh, and to be welcomed like that. We were inundated with, with visitors aboard. We had thousands of people come aboard during those days. In fact, is it was so crowded, it was difficult to get around on our own our own vessel that we called home it was it was tough but it was fun because all, all of these folks were just terribly interested in what was going on but we were also warned that if there was anything lying around loose you had better secure it because things were disappearing uh, souvenirs certainly and I, I heard the story that even people would uh, reach into the muzzles on the 16-inch guns and scratch out, scrape out the, the uh, grease that was there 
uh, and getting it under their fingernails and taking it home with them. I don't know what they were doing. But anyhow, they got, they got something off of the USS Missouri. President Truman came aboard the Missouri to conduct the fleet review. The president sat down at the surrender table, a few feet away from the newly installed surrender plaque. Signing his name in Missouri's guest book, he said, this is the happiest day of my life. They treated us like a million dollars. The Big Apple really turned out. <laughs>